and uh, welcome to this uh, beautifully uh, decorated uh, dining hall and uh, for the uh, Pata annual dinner and uh, wonder if you could please take your seats and we'll um, uh, get the show on the road. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things first. Toilets uh, outside in the uh, foyer. Um, if uh, wine, drinks of any kind at the bar outside the door. Uh, tea and coffee will actually be served after the main course if you turn right just opposite the bar um, and um, as well as that Karina asked me to tell you that there are one or two um, raffle tickets left for the for these wonderful prizes on the table so please don't be shy and see Karina in pink uh, to uh, to buy an extra raffle ticket or two and um, uh, without any further ado, I'll introduce our president, Judith Francis, to welcome you and our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin, for introducing us and welcoming people here tonight. Good evening, everyone. Nina Mani. My name is Judith Francis and currently president of Pioneers SA, which is a great privilege and it is very much my pleasure to, uh, to uh, welcome you here tonight. Um, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians on whose ancestral lands we gather here this evening. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country and we respect and value their past, the current situation, and their ongoing connection to the land and their cultural beliefs. This land belongs to all of us. So we thank the Ghana people for sharing their land, and together we will ensure its history and heritage is preserved. And that is very much the role of Pioneers SA. An interesting um, piece of information is this week is NADOC week and the theme for this week is for our elders. The theme highlights how in every chapter of history and across all generations, elders are instrumental in shaping today's generation. So looking around this room, many of us are elders. And I think it should be through the work of history groups such as Pioneers SA that we are embracing our ancestors' stories and sharing them so today's young people can learn from their experiences. And also, by the way, while Googling today, it may not be a very well-known fact but today is World Chocolate Day. <laughs> and it's annually, you'll always remember this now, it's annually celebrated on the 7th of July. Now, we all know chocolate comes from the cocoa bean, which comes from a tree, so that makes it a green plant. Therefore, chocolate is a salad. <laughs> so no more thinking about you don't deserve it. If we look at the history, it's been a medicine. It's a known antioxidant and a mood enhancer. It's linked to stress release and can induce a calming effect on the body and mind. So my advice for you to take from today, make every day a chocolate. Because a, cho yeah. a chocolate a chocolate a day is a healthy choice. <laughs> so tonight is a very important, coming back to the serious side a little, tonight is a very important event in our calendar and it's wonderful that so many of you can be here with us tonight. So welcome all friends and members. I'd like to make a special welcome to the Honourable Dean Brown and he is a member, uh, which we're very pleased about, and Mrs. Rosalind Brown. Um, uh, Dean is um, a long-term, I don't know how long, but a long-term member, 
and uh, we all know that Dean served as the Premier of South Australia and also as um, Deputy Premier. Um, so he has some wonderful experiences to share and I'm sure to talk about. And your speciality was geography, I believe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was it? Yeah. So um, he's uh, also a font of knowledge in that area of South Australia. And I thank Mr Chris Ward. I'm not sure where Chris is seating. Is he seated to that? He's here. Thank you. Uh, Chris is the current president of the Kangaroo Island Pioneers Association. And I thank him for making the time to come along tonight. One of the things we overlook, I think, is that the first settlement in South Australia was on Kangaroo Island. And I know all Kangaroo Island descendants are very proud of that fact. And a little snippet I found in a paper put out by the um, keeper was this, and I think this is so important, nearly July the 9th, but it was on July 27th in 1836, a town, Kingscote, at Reeves Point was established. First town. Homes were built and gardens and fruit trees planted, with the ionic mulberry tree still flourishing and bearing fruit today. So I think we must not overlook that, and the South Australian government recognised that, rather than Glenelg as the first settlement. I also welcome our past president, Mr David Forsyth and Pavey. I saw David come in somewhere around, <laughs> and lovely that you're both here tonight. And I want to personally give a special welcome to Chris and Patricia Young. Where are Chris and Patricia tonight? Right. This is their third annual dinner and they come across from Victoria each year for us. So they make it a special event, and I think that's absolutely wonderful that you show that loyalty to us. I've only received a few um, apologies, but I'm sure there are others. So I've had an apology from Dean and Carolyn Kemp. Dean was a former president. Elizabeth and Neville Harris, and Michael Smith. Are there any other apologies from anyone else? Um, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge uh, Carolyn Spooner and her husband, Jeff Sando, um, as our special guest tonight. I'm not sure if you want me to share this, but you know, Google's a wonderful tool. Um, uh, Carolyn has worked at the State Library for 44 years. Oh, so I think that's worth celebrating. But what I think it says is a strong endorsement of her knowledge and understanding of South Australian history. And so therefore she is an absolutely, um, I suppose, well-versed speaker. And we're so looking forward to you speaking tonight. Um, Sir Hubert Wilkins is a bit of an enigma and it's great that you're opening up our minds to his works. He was a polar explorer, as we know, but a nice little quote you wrote, he was an endearing man of science and spiritualism. So we look forward to hearing a much more broader picture of his life. So before we begin our meal tonight, I'd just like us to join together and say in a way in our heads, um, thank you for the abundance of blessings we have here in South Australia and be thankful for the fact that we can meet tonight and enjoy the company of old and new friends. So please relax and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. are still eating but uh, to make sure that we get the most out of this evening's 
uh, information session, I'd like to introduce, without any further ado, Carolyn Spooner from the State Library of South Australia. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about Henry Hubert Wilkins. Hubert, I, oh, I did get it right, Thank right. You, Thanks, you. Carolyn. Thank you. And if anybody's interested in the cricket, England 5 for 88. <laughs> so, can this come down a little bit? So, our story begins some 65,000 years ago when the First Nations people told their stories and kept their memories of this place alive in their oral and artistic traditions. Fast forward to 1836, and in the group of ships that arrived with the first European settlers, your antecedents, was the brig Emma. And on board were William Wilkins, a farmer, and his very pregnant wife Mary, and their two boys. So what a spirit of adventure they must have had. Their son Henry, or Harry, was born three days after the proclamation ceremony. He was the first surviving baby born on the South Australian mainland. And of course you may know that Robert Googe's wife Harriet went into labour with Henry Hindmarsh Googe while Robert is reading the proclamation. <laughs> but sadly, mother and son only lived for three months. William Wilkins was soon making himself useful in the colony and he became the first licensee of the Market Tavern in Mile End in December 1840. And by the way, what would we do without Bob Hode's wonderful reference book, Hotels and Publicans in South Australia, 1836 to 1999? I'm seeing a few nods there. Now, William Wilkins also built, at his own expense, in 1844, a new wooden bridge known as the Wilkins Bridge for the community over the River Torrens, which stood about near the present-day Hindmarsh Bridge at Port Road. Now, William's son Harry was also an adventurer. At 16, he went to the goldfields, then he worked as a drover. Then he married Louisa Smith, here they are in later life. They look very strong-minded, don't they? And they ran the Victor Harbour Hotel for four years. Then, after the passing of the Strangways Act in 1869, which made it easier for farmers to buy land, Harry and Louisa became the first farmers at Mount Bryan East. Now you can see Mount Bryan East on the far right, with the peak of Mount Bryan in the centre, and the town of Hallett on the left. It's a long, dusty drive on a dirt road to get to the signposted cottage. Who's been there? Well done, good. In this cottage, Louise and Harry had 10 more kids over the next 21 years. But on the 31st of October, which is Halloween in 1888, their lucky 13th child, George Hubert, was born when Louisa had just turned 50. So he certainly had a spirit of adventure in his DNA from his parents and his grandparents. And he's also something of a mystical baby because there's no birth certificate for George Hubert Wilkins. And this is the cottage before it was restored in 2001 with the support of the entrepreneur and benefactor, the wonderful Dick Smith. George had a thirst for knowledge as a child. He could read and write by the age of five, and he became a voracious reader, developing his interest in natural history through writers such as Charles Darwin. He walked the nine kilometers from the cottage to the little schoolhouse on the right. And on the left is the Methodist church, where young George used to sing in the choir. He held deep religious convictions, and he was also impressed with the connections to the spiritual world that the local indigenous Najari people felt. And he was interested in their bush telegraphy, and he used to hang out and camp with the indigenous kids and share their bush tucket of snakes and witchetty grubs. 
Unfortunately, the Wilkins farm at Mount Bryan was on the wrong side of Goida's line, which meant drought was ever present. But the area produces fabulous wool. This is Collinsville station country. As a lad, George used to shear and he looked after 200 sheep and some horses. He also cared for his own plot of land and hay. He became a good horse rider, a good shot, and developed self-sufficiency, resilience, and a love of the outdoor life where he learned his bushcraft. George had to take his turn ploughing the fields, but it's said that he would walk along with one hand on the plough and another hand reading a book. <laughs> During the Federation drought of 1900, George experienced its devastating effect on farm animals and crops. He wished there was a way that you could be prepared for extreme weather conditions to avoid misery for farmers and their animals. And at the age of 12, he decided he would spend his life trying to understand the weather. He wondered if the key to predicting weather patterns might lie in the polar regions, and he dreamt of exploring the North and South Poles. When George was 16, his parents retired to Adelaide, and they bought a house in Oxenbold Street in Parkside, where George lived for three years. I looked up Oxenbold Street in the postal directories. Anybody use the postal directories? No. Yeah, fabulous. And there's Harry Wilkins, but in 1906 there were no house numbers. But by 1916 there were house numbers, so Mrs. Louisa Wilkins, who was by then a widow, was living at number eight. So I went to have a look at it. And the owners were at home and they were amazed to find that there was a famous South Australian living in their house. And we agreed that there should be a plaque on the house. Having moved to town, George took the opportunity to develop his interest in things mechanical. In the mornings, he was an apprentice to an engineering firm, and in the afternoons, he attended classes in electrical engineering at the School of Mines. George also loved music, and in the evenings, he studied music at the newly opened conservatorium and was taught by the singing teacher, Frederick Bevan. He was a fabulous dude. Now, George didn't take his final university exams. I think for him, the knowledge was the important thing. Having the bit of paper wasn't so important. But armed with the latest university knowledge, he was soon working in the new emerging technology of electrical wiring. And he was happy to be hands-on with machinery, with which he felt an affinity. In today's language, he would become the machine. So he was racing around Adelaide, fitting new electrical wiring in buildings. He also got interested in photography, and he had a job travelling around country towns with 10 cinema operators for 18 months. Then in 1908, he sought more adventure, and he stowed away on a ship to Sydney, where he honed his cinematography skills. And interestingly, at that time, Australia was leading the world in the production of silent films, and more than 60 features were shot in 1911 alone, and George rushed from one production to the next as a cameraman. Then a chance meeting with the founder of British Gaumont Films led to an offer to join the company in London as a newsreel reporter. So in 1912, he travels to Gaumont Studios in England, filming images for news footage. He actually visits 27 countries in 18 months and he becomes a special correspondent and photographer for the Daily Chronicle newspaper in Turkey during the First Balkans War of 1912, in which he became the first official war photographer to shoot actual combat footage, mostly on horseback while dodging bullets. And he was the first person to fly over a front line in an aeroplane. And he was very nearly executed by firing squad after being arrested as a spy. You can't believe this stuff, can you folks? Back in London, George saw his first aeroplane, and of course he learned to fly and navigate, although again he didn't sit for his pilot license. He experiments with aerial photography, 
becoming the first person to take moving pictures from the air strapped to the fuselage. <laughs> so he's ready to document any adventures he finds himself in. In 1913, Gaumont asked George to join a five-year expedition to the Arctic as a cameraman and photographer, and of course he said yes. So George joined Villemer Stephenson's Canadian Arctic Exhibition, Exhibition, Expedition, as second in command, and he quickly learnt the art of survival in polar regions. He became something of a Bear Grylls when Stephenson abandoned his ship, the Carluk, in the pack ice. Amazingly, the library has 12 books by Villemer Stephenson, including his 1921 book on this expedition called The Friendly Arctic. Great title, isn't it? <laughs> Stephenson came to rely on Wilkins as a man able to adapt himself to anything. And this is just one reference among 84 pages of references to Wilkins in the Friendly Arctic. Stephenson writes, I have never known anyone who worked harder than Wilkins. He would be cleaning the scraps of meat off the leg bones of a wolf before breakfast and scraping the fat from a bear skin up to bedtime at night. His diaries were filled with information about the specimens he gathered, his fingers were stained with the photographic chemicals used in the development of his innumerable plates and films. His mind was always alert and his response always cheerful when a new task was proposed. Wilkins' photographs of the Inuit people give an insight into a resourceful people adapted to the natural environment and he learnt much from them, loved spending time with them including sharing a seance with the local shaman and showing his movies to them. But after three years in the Arctic, the expedition has got letters from home in 1916. And George finds that his father has died, his mother wants him home, and World War I's been going for more than a year. So he returns home to Australia to see his family in Adelaide and to enlist. In May 1917, George was commissioned as second lieutenant in the Australian Flying Corps in the AIF. But he wasn't supposed to fly because it turns out he was colour blind. So in April 1918, he was appointed an official photographer with the Australian War Records on the Western Front, headed by Charles Bean, and his senior officer was the charismatic New South Wales photographer Frank Hurley. So they are two names of legend, Charles Bean, Frank Hurley. Here's Lieutenant Wilkins on the right, using a disabled tank to get a better view on the flat terrain at the Hindenburg Line. He was wounded several times, mainly from trying to get as close to the action in the front line as possible. He was awarded the Military Cross and Bar, the only official photographer from any war to receive a combat decoration. He actually took command of some American infantry under German fire when they lost their officer until they were relieved. He was promoted to captain and was famously called by General Monash the bravest and most useful man in the AIF. Now one of your members, Chris Featherston, is Chris here tonight? Please, hello. Chris was in Belgium recently at, and at the In Flanders Fields Museum where the Wilkins story was told and it highlighted his role as the war photographer. So thanks for sending that to me, Chris, that was great. Wilkins' next piece of excitement was the great air race of 1919 to compete for the Australian government's prize of £10,000 for the first all-Australian crew to fly from England to Australia within 30 consecutive days. Captain Wilkins was appointed navigator in a Blackburn kangaroo biplane, replacing Charles Kingsford Smith. For the great air race, George designed his own navigation instruments, such as a position finder, which allowed him to take solar position readings through even a brief break in the clouds. Every half hour, he would complete a log to record wind conditions, cloud formations, the height of various layers, and the effects of turbulence in the tropics. 
Now, unfortunately, due to engine failure, the aircraft had to make an emergency landing at Suda Bay, Crete, and it was abandoned there. And of course, we know who the winners of the Great Air Race were. Ross and Keith Smith, and the mechanics Bennett and Shires. And their Vickers Vimy is now on display in its spiffy new location at Adelaide Airport. Anybody been there? It is fantastic, you must go. It is just fabulous. George made his first visit to Antarctica in 1920 in the short-lived British Imperial Antarctic Expedition, but he loved it and he couldn't wait to get back. So this is one of his images and it's fitting that Wilkins Sound, the Wilkins Ice Shelf, the Wilkins Coast, and an air and a landing base were all named in his honour. He was delighted the next year to be invited to join the legendary Sir Ernest Shackleton's quest expedition to Antarctica as the naturalist and chief of the scientific staff. He spent six weeks alone on South Georgia Island photographing and recording the flora and fauna. And on tiny Nightingale Island, which was occupied by more than three million pairs of birds, Wilkins discovered some of only a hundred pairs of a rare finch, now known as the Wilkins bunting. So the specimens that he collected and his field notes were given to the British Museum, who were impressed by his scientific diligence. As a result of this work, the British Museum asked him to lead the Australian and Ireland's expedition to document Australia's disappearing wildlife. Wilkins told the Chronicle newspaper that the expedition has been prompted by the fact that these areas will soon be opened for cotton cultivation, so that native life will be driven to other areas or entirely exterminated. From April 1923 for two years, he travelled more than 4,000 kilometres through the deserts, forests and islands of Queensland and the Northern Territory. His 290-page book, Undiscovered Australia, was published in London in 1928, and it contained devastating findings on the environment. And Wilkins didn't pull his punches in his criticism of the white fellas' treatment of the land and of the indigenous people which didn't endear him to the Australian government. As well as the mammals he was asked to collect, being the enthusiast that he was, he also collected more than 5,000 plants, birds, insects, fish, minerals and fossils, many species never seen before. One of the specimens that he collected at Roper River was a rock wallaby, which the British Museum named Wilkins's rock wallaby. The expedition took six months longer than planned, but it ran only 10 pounds over budget, and Wilkins donated all proceeds from his book royalties, newspaper stories and lectures to the British Museum. So, Wilkins has had enough of the tropics. He's hankering to get back to the polar regions, and he tries to raise funds for an Australasian polar Pacific expedition, but local businessmen in Adelaide weren't interested but he gets support from the Detroit Aviation Society and the Detroit newspaper to establish once and for all whether there was land in the unexplored heart of the Arctic. In 1927, Wilkins teamed up with a young pilot, Ben Ilson, and ignoring the warnings that compasses wouldn't work over the North Pole, off they set. On their second attempt to fly over across the Arctic, returning in terrible weather, Wilkins wasn't sure which direction the Fairbanks Aerodrome was, and he couldn't identify the small village below. So they dare not land, so Ben Elson flew low over the village, and Wilkins dropped a note down asking what the name of the village was, which the villagers stamped out in the snow. But that village wasn't on his map. So they went around again and he dropped another note asking the people to stamp out an arrow pointing in the direction to Fairbanks and this time the villagers all formed themselves in the shape of an arrow. <laughs> so, old Aussie ingenuity. On April the 15th, 
1928, Wilkins and Ben Elson successfully flew from Barrow, Alaska on the left to the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen, a dangerous 20-hour flight through storms and blizzards, where Wilkins found that his reading of the clouds was as useful a tool as any of his navigation instruments. They flew for 3,500 kilometres, 1,300 of which had never been seen before, and they confirmed there were no unknown islands. The American Geographical Society said, it's a feat in navigation which can confidently be declared unparalleled in the history of flying. And after this historic flight, George and Ben were heroes and had a ticker tape parade in New York. Wilkins' account of these flights, Flying the Arctic, published in 1928, is an action-packed 300 detail pages, all drama and ingenuity, but also poetic. Describing the tricky conditions they're flying through at one point, he writes, on the opposite side to the sun, there shortly appeared two complete rainbow circles, and in the center, a ghost-like shadow of our plane. It seemed to me that it mocked us as we sped on. I have seldom been so awed. It felt as if a great vacuum were engulfing us and that we were doomed forever to fly into an endless gray mist as punishment for having dared to venture over the Arctic wastes on wings of fragile wood. The late 1920s saw Wilkins rewarded for his dedication to science for the betterment of humankind. For his pioneering flight from Alaska to Norway, he was awarded the highest medal from the Royal Geographical Society in London. More importantly, on the 4th of June 1928, George Hubert Wilkins was knighted by King George V for 15 years of consecutive work in the interests of science and national service. And because he shared the King's name, out of respect, he asked to be knighted as Sir Hubert rather than Sir George and was known as Sir Hubert thereafter. An even better reward for being a wonderful human being was his marriage to the lovely Suzanne Evans, an Australian-born American actress. The marriage was a modern one as each of them continued their own careers. There were no kids, I think they were too busy doing other things. And here they are with the grandson of Jules Verne. <coughs> So, having flown over the Arctic Ocean, Wilkins' next challenge was to fly over Antarctica. <coughs> Sir Hubert's fame had earned him a new backer, newspaper baron William Randolph Hearst. And on the 16th of November 1928, as the Wilkins Hearst Antarctic Expedition, he and his pilot Ben Elson made the first aeroplane flight in the Antarctic. A month later, Wilkins and Elson flew further over the Antarctic Peninsula and discovered new land from the air for the first time in history. And Wilkins named various landmarks, including Hearst Land after his sponsor. And Hearst later thanked Wilkins by inviting him aboard the Graf Zeppelin on its 22 day around the world voyage in August 1928 to report on the technical aspects of the first around the world flight to be made by an airship. Now after that excitement, he conceived a project to reach the North Pole by taking a submarine under the pack ice, as you would. <laughs> and as luck would have it, a wealthy adventurer, Lincoln Ellsworth, put up the money for an expedition. So Sir Hubert recycled a World War I Navy submarine and optimistically renamed it Nautilus after Jules Verne's fictional submarine in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was first published in 1870. We have 10 editions of this book in our children's literature research collection. The expedition captured the public imagination. He even received a postcard to Sir Hubert Wilkins, with best wishes for success in all your adventures. <laughs> Sincerely, Mickey Mouse and Walt Disney. <laughs> and he met them in the flesh. At this time, Sir Hubert was one of the most famous people on the planet. The expedition left the United States in June 1931 for the great adventure. But as you may know, the old submarine Nautilus really wasn't up to it. But they did manage to go a short way under the ice. 
They made a lot of useful scientific undersea observations, which are still being used today. But the expedition was considered a failure by his backers because he didn't get to the North Pole. His 345 page book on the adventure under the North Pole was actually published before the expedition and seems to have been written in case he came to grief because he documents his preparations which might help the next subarctic adventurer and he also writes a 150 page autobiographical account of his life. Now just last week the Friends of the State Library have republished this book which is great to bring it to a right audience and I was asked to write the introduction and Dick Smith came over for the launch which was fabulous and so the book can be obtained from the Friends of the State Library. There's a documentary on the Nautilus voyage which we've got on DVD but as is the way with these things you can see the whole thing on um, YouTube just put in Nautilus and whatever all 50 minutes of it. So Hubert's next adventure was in 1936 when he and Lady Wilkins were guests on the maiden transatlantic flight of the airship Hindenburg to America. We know how that ended. After 30 years away from South Australia, in September 1938 he returned home to a visit and the borough record writes that Sir Hubert wants to rediscover the swimming pools, yabby holes, gum trees, shearing sheds and old mine shafts of Mount Bryan and Burra, which he knew so well as a boy. If there are any sheep to be shorn, Sir Hubert wants to try his hand again. At 16, he was a competent hand shearer. His best tally for a day was 73. He particularly wants to find a hole in the Ulalu Creek, in whose muddy waters he almost disappeared for the last time in the too enthusiastic search for yabbies. He wants to see some of the sheep bred by his old school friend, Mr. Arthur Collins of Collinsville, but most of all, he wants to see a borough sheep sale. But after that happy visit, it's 1939 and the outbreak of World War II. Sir Hubert, at the age of 51, bless his heart, offered his services to the Australian and British Armed Services, who said thanks but no thanks because of his age. I mean, these days, 51's nothing. But undaunted, he got involved in a number of missions for various United States government agencies, including intelligence activities for the Office of Strategic Services, which was the forerunner of the CIA, in Europe and Asia, where he could travel freely as a famous explorer and aviator. He was also a consultant to the American Army on clothing and rations suitable for cold conditions, and he also trained troops in Arctic survival skills. So Hubert was also interested in the spiritual world and in the paranormal and telepathy, sparked by his early experiences with Indigenous peoples and his observation that Indigenous Australians seemed to be aware of events happening far away. So Hubert lived to see the first exploration of space by Sputnik in 1957, and he would be interested to know that the historic Talus map of South Australia from the State Library's map collection went into outer space in 2005 on the Space Shuttle Discovery with South Australian astronaut Andy Thomas, making it the Library's furthest travelled item. <laughs> and as you may know, Andy Thomas is the great-great-grandson of Frederick George Waterhouse, the first curator of the South Australian Museum. In the last years of his life, Sir Hubert never really retired. He kept busy on his farm in Pennsylvania, doing various consultancy and going to the Arctic every year. He would have been thrilled to learn in August 1958 that the submarines USS Skate and Nautilus finally made an under ice Arctic transit. But suddenly, three months later, on the 30th of November, at the age of 70, he left this earthly life. The British government wanted to bury Sir Hubert in Westminster Abbey, but the American government followed his wishes and scattered his ashes at the North Pole from the USS Skate, with the Australian, British and American flags flying. Lady Wilkins survived him 
and 16 years later, her ashes were also scattered at the North Pole to join those of her beloved husband. On the footpath outside Adelaide University on North Terrace is a plaque commemorating Sir Hubert, adventurer, polar explorer, aviator, submariner, photographer, geographer. And it's good to know that adventurer is a thing. And I just learnt that uh, Dean Brown had something to do with the placement of this plaque, so well done. Wilkins would be so proud to know that the University of Adelaide established a Sir Hubert Wilkins Chair of Climate Change, where he was described as Australia's first white fellow conservationist. Sir Hubert is permanently remembered in the State Library in a bronze bust by John Dowie. And if you want to find out more about him, there are books about him in public libraries and in the State Library. Simon Nash's biography from 2005 is an excellent book. Simon writes that for Wilkins, adventure was never useful unless it provided knowledge. But Peter Fitzsimons blockbuster published in 2021 really brings Wilkins alive and reaches a new audience. And Jeff Maynard's book published last year has heaps of photographs never before seen. On a personal level, Sir Hubert comes across as endearing, enthusiastic, a good companion. He loved a party, entertaining on the piano or organ, and was as much at home among celebrities in California as with hardened sailors on the ocean. As an occasional social drinker, it's amusing to see him advertising Lord Calvert whiskey, but obviously another way for a celebrity to earn some money for his next scientific venture. In closing, the State Library is proud to play a part in preserving Sir Hubert Wilkins' heritage. What I find admirable about him is that from an early age he had a thirst for knowledge. He documented everything he did. He was motivated to discover things that would make the world a better place. He was compassionate. He cared for animals and treated all people with respect. What a wonderful South Australian. Thank you. if we've got time for comments, questions, anecdotes. Far away. Um, uh, Smithy's aircraft was the aircraft that was used by Sir Hubert. That wasn't touched on, but I'm assuming that it's known to you. Um, yeah, he sold his aircraft to Smithy and he renamed it from De Detroit to the Southern Cross. Right. Yeah, that was how it happened. And it was funny. Um, Smithy was supposed to be the navigator in the great air race, but he got on the wrong side of the airplane manufacturer because he'd been buying up old planes and barnstorming around England, crashing them and getting the insurance money. And I think they decided no. So they got Sir Hubert Wilkins instead. So. No. Carol, thank you very much indeed. That was uh, an absolute pleasure to listen to. And what an amazing character. Uh, he, um, he's kind of the rock star equivalent of today. And uh, incredibly undervalued in yes. Australia. And, and heaven knows why. I mean, I guess he spent a lot of his time in America and, um, yeah. and a lot of his yeah. records uh, yeah. were in America. Yeah. But um, the more one learns of his uh, exploits, the more it's just gobsmacked, yeah. absolutely gobsmacked. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, his wife, of course, that you didn't have time to touch on, was an amazing character in her own oh. right. An accomplished opera singer, um, uh, belonged to a, a, an opera company in Melbourne, uh, uh, did something like uh, a dozen or more shows on Broadway when she went to America and there was a protege of uh, Nellie Melba. No. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And so, um, and, and a, a very good looker at the same time, I believe, <laughs> uh, which had nothing to do with why yeah. Sir Hubert was, yeah. uh, was interested. But uh, an amazing character in her own right, uh, the daughter of a, a Welsh miner from a little town called Valhalla 
in Victoria, uh, in the Gippsland area. If you're ever in Victoria, go and have a look at Valhalla. It's a beautiful little old mining village with a little old gold train. You can trundle around the, the district. Once again, yeah. Carolyn, thank you for bringing uh, Sir George Hubert Wilkins Ooh. to life. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And, and please accept this token of our... Uh, thank you so much. Now, Karina tells me that uh, we forgot to give away one prize. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. Somebody has donated a wonderful painting. Uh, it's probably the, the best prize of the lot, I should think. It was and actually painted by one of our members. Oh, there you go. Uh, so, um, have, have anybody still got their tickets and haven't thrown them in the bin? I'll draw the very, very last prize, and it's an orange B10. We have a winner. Thank you very much.